Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Community Engagement Manager at the Haley Public Library. Tonight's talk is Restoring the Wood River to Health. We'll learn from Wood River Land Trust Restoration Specialist Ryan Santo what factors are reducing fish and wildlife habitat along the river and its tributaries, and the Land Trust's current restoration efforts. I always like to feature a book that we have here at the library. This is one I've um, uh, suggested a couple of times before. It's called The Snake River, Window to the West by conservation writer Tim Palmer. Uh, Tim starts at the headwaters of the Snake River in Wyoming and travels the full length of it down to the Columbia. Columbia. And I thought it was a good link for this talk because Ryan will talk about the tributaries coming into the Big Wood River and the way we use it and impacts uh, the, that our use can have on them. And that is exactly what Tim Palmer's book does for a larger river, the Snake River. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ryan Santo. As I mentioned a moment ago, he is the restoration specialist for the Wood River Land Trust. Originally from New Jersey, he has spent the last 14 years monitoring endangered salmon and steelhead populations in the Snake River and Upper Columbia River basins. Ryan graduated with a bachelor's degree in fisheries and aquaculture from State University of New York, Cobbleskill. He has worked throughout the Northwest with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and most recently with the Nez Perce Tribe of Northern Idaho. At the Land Trust, Ryan focuses on implementing water conservation and habitat rehabilitation projects. He led the currently, sorry, he led the recently completed mile-long Howard Preserve River Restoration Project, which will mitigate flooding on private property and enhance floodplain and natural fluvial processes. Um, so Ryan, I will spotlight you and uh, a warm virtual uh, Zoom welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You bet. So I'll uh, share my screen here. How's that looking for everyone? Looks great. Okay. Yeah, just um, thanks for that intro. Uh, really appreciate it. I just one. One thing that we, we are working, we're still working on that Bellevue Reach mile long design. Um, and, and actually, I'll, that's one of the projects I'll be showcasing, but we'll talk more about that. But um, and that's been a great collaboration. But um, tonight, I hope to show, you know, the, some of the impacts that have happened to the Bigwood River, the fishery that it used to be, um, and how those impacts are kind of brought us to where we are today. And what are some of the things we can do to kind of reverse some of these bad practices um, that's happened in the past? Uh, another thing I hope uh, you get out of this talk is that when you're out on the river, you can start to point out some of these um, limitations to, to the Bigwood River and to habitat to, uh, for fish and, and for wildlife as well. So talk a little bit about our fishery from yesterday. So, the photo on the left here, this is a uh, trout caught by one lucky angler. Um, it's, it, was, uh, it weighed around 13 pounds. It's around 31 inches long. And if you go through the historical records of old newspapers and such, it was kind of common to catch fish this large. Um, in the next photo in the center, uh, we're looking at one day's catch on the Bigwood River. And all these photos are like the early 1900s and you could see those two larger fish kind of seem similar to size what of uh, the fish caught on the left as well so and then on the right that's me and my son out fishing on the big wood um that's about a 14 15 we'll call it a 15 inch trout and we caught a couple that day and we thought it was a great day but if you look back you know what the fishery used to be and what it is today it's really a, a shell of its former self and there's really a lot more capacity um, to enhance the fishery and enhance habitat uh, throughout the Big Wood. But let's talk about how we got here. So the Big Wood River suffered the fate of many rivers of the West due to settlement. Um, you know, there was uh, uh, 
large amount of, of grazing occurring. There was hydraulic mining uh, in the main channel and especially in the tributaries. And then a lot of the beavers were removed in the upper tributaries. So what happens here, uh, and we'll talk a lot about this throughout uh, the presentation is that when you remove beavers, they're eventually their, their beaver dams eventually fail. And what they've done over time is those beaver dams have to capture sediment and kept the water table high. Then when the beavers are gone and high flows wash them out, the creeks and rivers, they start to down cut. And what that means is they start digging down, as you can see in this photo here, down deeper and deeper and deeper, further disconnecting uh, from its floodplain and actually lowering the water table as well. And this is true on the Big Wood as well. And we'll go through some examples. And later on, we'll talk about how some projects where we're trying to reverse, uh, you know, be with beavers being eradicated from many of our tributaries. But I think the most recent uh, issues that we're dealing with and probably has the most impacts is development in the floodplain. So these are photos from the 2017 floods. I hope it doesn't uh, bring any bad memories to folks on the, on the presentation, but I wanted to point this out because when people build in the floodplain or along the river, usually one of the things that, you know, when they buy the property is already done or will have to do is that they harden that bank. And so bank hardening, what does that mean? It means that you put in, you know, either large rock like riprap, which we'll talk more about later, or you do some, something to the bank so where you don't want the river to move that bank at all. You want the river in that spot and keep it in that spot. And many of these uh, folks that are in these photos here have riprap the river and they still flood it anyway. And it, it really comes down if, if you have infrastructure or homes in the floodplain, 100 year floodplain, at some point it is gonna flood and it is gonna cause damage. And this development in the, in the floodplain has really reduced habitat potential um, on the Big Wood River. And next few slides, we'll, we'll go over that. So what do we have here? So we're looking at the Big Wood River at the Flying Heart Ranch Reach just north of Haley. On the left, this is aerial imagery from 1943. And on the right, aerial imagery from 2019. And what we did is that we, we measured the floodplain width in 1943 and compared that to the floodplain width um, in 2019. And you could see that in 2019, or sorry, in 1943, you had about 21, the floodplain width was about 2,100 feet. And if you look closely at this uh, aerial imagery, you could see old river channels, you could see a more complex habitats that we see today on the river. A lot of side channels. Some of these side channels connect to off-channel rearing habitats, which these are really critical in those colder months. If you have connection to like an off-channel pond or, or uh, some kind of slow moving water, those tend to be warmer in those cold months. So they really aid in uh, fish growth, which really helps with survival. And you just had more, um, uh, better riparian habitat and just overall better connection to the floodplain to really allow the river to create its own complex habitats. You know, we, we do some really great restoration work, but no one does it better than the river if it's allowed to. And since then, if you look to the right, now we have a floodplain width of a little hundred, a little over 700 feet. So now we have about a third of the habitat to work with compared to 1943. And this is due to development in the floodplain. So this is the Flying Heart um, neighborhood. Ron, I'm sorry, Ryan. Um, yeah. Someone's asking if you could speak up just a little bit. So you might need to either come a little bit close to your oh. computer or. Yeah. Thanks, Roger, for letting us know. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. So in this, in this next slide, what we have here, or what we're trying to show is that in 1943, um, these side channels around islands, they, they were populated with mature vegetation, um, especially down here as well. You could definitely see that. But now what do we, what do we see? Um, and we see this throughout the Bigwood River is that we see these bare islands or gravel bars. 
And the question is, why, why is that? And it's because that the river is so confined now, especially due to development. When we have high flows or high water years like 2017, a lot of those flood flows are constricted where historically it had the opportunity to spread out across the landscape, create habitats. But now it's so confined, the velocities are uh, much higher now. What they do is they rip out that mature vegetation and it kind of just continues on down, rips out that vegetation, that sediment becomes exposed or bed load, it moves downstream and hits this part, it rips that out, dumps more sediment, picks it up. And it's, it's unfortunate because we see this all over and it, it really looks like a scar on the, on the landscape. And uh, we'll show some other photos, but you know, without that mature vegetation, you're really losing that riparian habitat that's really important to keep temperatures cool, especially in a year like this. And also, um, you know, big game and other wildlife, most of them use rivers as migratory corridors. So if you don't have that mature stands of cottonwoods, you know, underneath those cottonwoods there's usually great grass and forbs and because of the shade it lasts longer and it's available for forage. And now that's, you know, it's completely gone. And also what's gone is uh, cover for big game as they're migratory or migratory through this uh, landscape. So here we have the, um, uh, the Adams Gulch uh, Reach. This is just north of Ketchum. Kind of a shorter, uh, shorter span valley. The floodplain width in 1943 was approximately like 1,200 feet. But now it's been, again, reduced to about a third. Now it's only a little over 400 feet. And it's because all this development that wasn't here in the 40s, all these homes have hardened their banks and it's not allowing the river to activate the floodplain and create new habitats. Um, and then also other restrictions like uh, the Adams Gulch Bridge, which wasn't there. Uh, oh, maybe it was, it looks like it is, something was there, but um, you know, now it's the, the kind of the term, if you want to sound really smart at a, at a party, you could use the term anastomosing uh, channel form. And really what that means is that multiple channels, uh, the river is allowed to uh, connect to the floodplain, create these new habitats. But it really in most of the area, or most of the river has been uh, diminished to really a single channel and really reduces uh, fish habitat. So here we have the Star Bridge Reach. So this is just south of Haley. Um, some people might, this is uh, Broadford Road. Some people might call it the Upper Broadford Road Bridge. Um, I didn't measure the uh, floodplain width here because in the 40s, the road was there um, then. And we just kind of want to point out the scarring on the landscape. You know, if, if anyone goes on Google Earth or any other kind of imagery website, you'll see this bare gravel bars. Um, and it really just reduces habitat potential on the Big Wood River. So really kind of go over what are the benefits of floodplain connectivity. So it allows the river to create these complex habitats. You know, those side channels and kind of those off channel um, Rearing habitats are great for survival of young fish. It's also really critical for spawning. Um, and also in high flows, uh, those side channels and off channel habitats really provide a refuge during high, those high muddy spring flows. So if you think about it, if you're in a reach or river and you're a fish and you're in this kind of channelized se uh, section and there's no place for you to get out during those spring months, and this is usually after spawning, at least for rainbow trout, you got to fight the river um, that whole time. Uh, granted, there might be some little side pockets you could, you could uh, find, but other fish are trying to find those spots too. And it's, it becomes more of a stressful situation than it really needs to be. And then also it's really important to protect these places that haven't been developed. So you know, our preserves along the Haley Greenway allow us to do some of these projects to kind of reverse these bad practices of channelization. And by doing that, allowing places where they're not developed, it actually reduces flooding impacts uh, to folks downstream because you're slowing down the water, 
And another great thing is that while you're slowing down the water, allowing it to pool up, kind of like what the photo we see here, um, while that water is then allowed to go down into the groundwater for recharge. So on the Bigwood River, our aquifers uh, pretty connected to surface flows of the river. There's some reaches where groundwater uh, pumps up a lot of water into, uh, the, into surface flows. It's called a gain in reach. There are other reaches, mainly down uh, below Bellevue, where there are more losing reaches and some surface flows go in to provide uh, recharge to groundwater. And, you know, on the big wood, uh, compared to other places, the groundwater you start seeing that coming back anywhere from one to three months later. So in the spring, uh, you have that connection of floodplains, that water goes down into the, into the aquifer. You're gonna see that you know, in the summer months when it's really critical for those fish to have more water, especially in a year like now when you know, temps could be high. Um, and so it, it's a good thing to really connect uh, floodplain habitats. Ryan, we have a question, and you may be going to touch on this later, but I'll just ask it now because it has to do with um, constriction of the of the floodplain. So here's yeah. the question from James: Has river floodplain river dash floodplain constriction disrupted the new cottonwood growth and seedling germination on gravel bars on the Snake River? Cottonwood regeneration has slowed over the past few decades due to changes in the timing and magnitude of floods? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a kind of a couple of questions there. So, you know, with climate change, we are expected to see, um, you know, those spring runoff to come early. So that might not really work well with the seedlings that are coming off the cottonwoods. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I think is, you know, since the, the river is constricted, and those high velo velocities are ripping through those gravel bars, it doesn't really allow for vegetation to, uh, to really pioneer those gravel bars. So I think there's kind of two things going on, going on there. So another limiting factor to habitat is uh, tributary connectivity and then also uh, barriers in, in the main stem. So, I think all of us have seen a culvert, um, you know, especially a, a full culvert like this, not an open bottom culvert, but an enclosed culvert driving through forest service roads. If you look down and you see a culvert with this kind of large drop, it's most likely a fish passage barrier. So it's just kind of another way of, of how the river and throughout it, the basin um, fish have been losing habitat. So now they don't have access to any of the habitat above this, and especially uh, important uh, for spawning. And there's a couple of reasons why a culvert can be a, a fish passage barrier. One could be the jump height's too high. Um, you know, fish need a nice jump pool, it's called. If you have a deep kind of long jump pool, they can, you know, they can make up, you know, higher than you think. Um, but once they get there, now you have this really uh, skinny laminar flow um, a very long distance for a fish to get up. And if gradients are really high, there's, there's no chance for fish to get up through here. So it's just something to consider as you're driving around and you see a culvert, most likely a barrier. Um, we do have some uh, main channel barriers. So this is uh, the District 45 head dam down in Bellevue. Um, at lower flows, this becomes a fish passage barrier. Higher flows, fish can make, make it up. And we're going to be talking about a project that we've been working with the D45 folks uh, to make this not a fish passage barrier. And we'll talk more about that. So, and then uh, in our basin, there's also some dams. So here is uh, the Sun Valley Lake Dam uh, up in Sun Valley. And, you know, the Sun Valley Lake Dam, it's, the purpose is really for aesthetics and recreation. But as you could see down here, this picture was taken in May. Uh, I think May 20th, 2020, which is usually around kind of the peak of spawning for rainbow trout. And you can see fish are trying to get up here. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about uh, this dam later on. But to kind of go over um, 
some tributaries that are disconnected, at least down in the uh, in mid, mid to upper valley. Um, there's probably, I know there's some tributaries of Warm Springs Creek that are disconnected, my, you know, mostly due to culverts, but I throw these up because it's just something to think about. So Trail Creek, which we just saw the Sun Valley Lake Dam is blocking Trail Creek. The dam is about two and a half miles up from the mouth. And up above that fish passage point, the basin is about 600 or sorry, 63 square miles which has a mean average flow. So throughout the year, the average is about 127 CFS, which is actually about the amount of water that is crossing the Haley gauge uh, on the big wood right now. So it's quite a bit of water and it's quite a bit of habitat um, in there. And then Deer Creek as well is a fish passage barrier. So both Trail Creek and Deer Creek, their water actually reaches the big wood, which is a good thing. Uh, tributaries tend to have colder water, helps cool down the big wood. Uh, but again, even Deer Creek's pretty large, it's 50 square miles, and its average flow is a lot less, though, about 38 CFS. And then we have Quigley Creek and Indian Creek here in Haley. Uh, these creeks never make it to the Big Wood River, and there's multiple reasons why that is, and mostly do um, some of it to irrigation, but other uh, some of it's also for city infrastructure, and you know it's most likely, at least in our lifetimes, these will not be connected. So, and then here's a photo on your right. So this is Upper Trail Creek. I think we've all seen these beaver ponds as we're going up and over Trail Creek Pass. Over here is Trail Creek running along here, and these these habitats are just critical for survival and growth of young fish and really, um, really goes to increasing uh, productivity of our fish populations. So kind of do like- A, a, quick, a quick question on that Trail Creek um, slide that you just showed. So yeah. are the, tr I mean, that's known as a pretty good area to fish. Are those all stocked fish? Or are those fish that somehow are able to get above the Sun Valley Lake Dam and have just been able to be self-sustaining since then? Right, so, so Fishing Game stocks Trail Creek in about three or four locations. They're usually uh, locations where they can get a truck to. So I, I don't think these are stocked fish um, and they're, the, some of the locations are down lower. Um, so I think these are more natural fish where that's a good point because if you fish Trail Creek below, ten, a 10 inch fish is a good fish. But up in here, you got some hogs in here. Um, <laughs> and it's really because, you know, you have this beaver dam complex. It's probably really helped with springs in the area that keep re, re uh, energizing or rejuvenating these ponds. And they just, they do really well with survival and productivity of, of fish populations. Mm. And you know these these types of habitats are rare. You know there's some beaver dam complexes up in the upper wood, and um, you know there's some actually down low where when there's water down there, kind of up above Stanton Crossing. But there's not really much of these, so it's it's important to get fish to these uh, critical habitats. So kind of overview of the benefits of tributaries. So in those you know low summer months where potentially the, the river's getting a little warm, you know, if there's connection to these tributaries, it pot provides a cold water refugia. And then also, like I said, it provides critical spawn and rearing habitat as well, which really leads to increased survival and productivity of salmonids. And I do say that a lot, survival, productivity, and really what that means is more and bigger fish, right? Like to get back so like, I don't think we could ever get back to those photos back in 1900, but I think we can get it to a sense where we really see a difference in our fish populations here on the Big Wood River. And then the, the other limiting factor I'll talk about tonight is the effects of riprap. So this photo on the left is Warm Springs Creek, kind of below the, the dog park a little ways. Um, and this is a great contrast of what habitat should look like on the right and what habitat looks like when you riprap. So important thing to know with riprap is that it's mostly built at a vertical wall and really 
it doesn't really provide any habitat for fish. Now, granted, I know some of you maybe on the, on the presentations like, well, I've caught big fish along Ripper. I have too, but um, Thoreau in Idaho, uh, Thoreau, who used to work for Idaho Fish Game, he's done work, great work all over the state of Idaho. And what he did in 1990 was a study on the Big Wood River where he looked at different habitats and their uh, trout densities compared to those habitats. So habitats associated with cover or, you know, like this photo shown here, large wood debris or healthy riparian habitat, like we just showed in the photo on the left on the right bank, um, have eight to 10 times higher density of trout compared to sections or habitats that have riprap. So think about it, um, there was a, a study that was done by Blaine County, it's called the Big Wood River Atlas. It's a great document. Um, if you just Google Big Wood River Atlas, Blaine County, it'll, it'll show up. And it really does a reach by reach uh, look of the Big Wood River from the SNRA boundary all the way down to Stanton Crossing. And what they found is that about 40% of our river is riprap. So just think if we were able to remove 20% of that riprap, how much more fish or bigger fish we could have in the big one. And these are some of the things where we're just trying to reverse those bad practices, bad historic practices that happened in the past. And granted, you know, it's not the fault of anyone. This is just what people did. And, but I think slowly people are starting to realize the more natural system we have, it's better for fish, it's better for reducing flooding impacts as well. But an alternative to riprap is something uh, it's kind of called the rock toe uh, structure. So there's a lot going on here and we'll, and we'll walk you through it. Um, so over here is where the river would be. And here is like the river bottom or the channel bottom. And what they do, instead of building that vertical wall of riprap, you use rock similar to what they use in riprap, but you put it, uh, you slope it back and you actually key it in underneath uh, the channel bottom. And by sloping it back, um, it allows for riparian plants to kind of pioneer this area, which we've shown, let me, let me go back. You know, in this photo here, it's not really much riparian plants. And then over here, there's nothing, right? Compared to an unaltered uh, bank. So it allows for riparian plants. And then once you get up to bank full height, so bank full is the flow or elevation where the river should have a chance or the opportunity to access its floodplain. So once you get to bank full, you can create kind of this floodplain bench. And then you could also plant, you know, cottonwoods and, you know, uh, plant species that you would see on a floodplain. And this is a great alternative to riprap. We're providing cover, which the road, you know, clearly showed provides higher densities of trout. We are also allowing the river to expand, even though it's not much, right? Still allowing it to expand and kind of slow down those flood flows. And when, when we're looking at habitat projects, we really look at how can we enhance this reach or river or this, this location to the greatest extent possible. Since there is so much development, we're not advocating for people to, you know, pick up their houses or go somewhere else. You know, people have the right to protect their homes and their infrastructure, but let's do it in a way that it protects your bank. And it is a bank hardening treatment, but it does provide some benefits for habitat and some benefits for river function. So these alternatives uh, to riprap go, go along. And here's a project. So that's part, this is part of that Bellevue Reach, um, D45. I think uh, John Wright's on there. He was a big part of this project. Really appreciate the work those guys did on it, on this project. And so this is what it kind of looks like. So the bank is sloped back. Um, they did a great job. Again, Willow's established here. Uh, and you know, this was completed. And we'll talk a little bit more, or we show it a little bit more in the next few slides, but this was completed in 2020. So 2020, 2021, we had really low water years. I think if we get more water out onto this, onto this bank, we'll actually see more willows coming up, but they did a really great job with this. And it's a great alternative to what it could be 
just rip wrapping this this whole section. So, so we kind of covered three major limitations to fish habitat and river function uh, on the Big Wood River. So in the next few slides, we're going to talk about projects that are addressing these three big issues. So we can kind of reverse these bad practices, but um, you know, enhance uh, the habitat and really enhance our fishery as well. So the first one is uh, this Bellevue Reach project. So just to kind of orientate orientate folks. Uh, here's the Lower Broadford Road Bridge. This is the city of Bellevue. This is the Howard Preserve and the kind of lower reaches of this project site uh, is kind of like Riverside Drive, it's right down here. And so historically in uh, the last couple of decades, homeowners have been rip wrapping, uh, the kind of rip wrap wars were, were happening in this reach. Uh, one side would rip wrap, that would push flows across, they rip wrap the push and it's kind of ping pong all the way down. So in 2019, um, the Land Trust and Trout Unlimited got everyone together. We got everyone in the room. Everyone just kind of talked out some of the things they've observed on the river for decades. And we got some great information uh, through that process. Um, and it's also important to note that, you know, the Land Trust is uh, heavily invested in doing these habitat projects, but we couldn't do any of these without partnerships and collaboration with partners. Um, they really go a long way. It makes projects better. And I'm really happy with uh, the, the progress of this mile long reach of uh, uh, Big Wood River. So here's the, uh, so what we've done. And, and so yeah, we got everyone together in 2019. Everyone contributed funds to this mile long design, which it's a condensed version of what, what we're proposing to to do in this mile long reach. And so since then, subgroups have been working on kind of sub projects of this mile long design. And we're kind of just working our way through and there was kind of a priority list um, that was developed by the stakeholder group. So uh, D45 folks, Trout Unlimited, Flood Control District, they were able to get money and some grant funds through a flood mitigation grant. Uh, and to do that, that project I just showed you, kind of that alternative to riprap. And that was done in February, 2020. And then uh, the land trust, we partnered with flood control district, uh, city of Bellevue, got some flood mitigation funds through the state um, and uh, finished the lower Howard Preserve project in March, 2021. Trout Unlimited and the D45 folks are looking to address the fish passage barrier at, at the head dam. That was a photo I showed of a, a barrier. Um, you know, part of that project is going to allow fish to, to move through at all, all flows, but also it's going to provide some uh, natural fluvial processes, that allow sediment to move through, um, which is an important part of how rivers work. So, they're still working on that. They got the final design done and, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully we could get work on that uh, next year. And then the land trust is heading up this project. Um, we just got, just got it fully funded. We're super excited. It's a pretty big project, op opening and enhancing about 2,600 feet of side channels down through this, this reach, creating a bunch of those floodplain benches and adding a lot of large woody debris that's really gonna enhance habitat, but also by, you know, with the protection of Howard Preserve and working with the landowners down here, we're really expanding the river, right? And what we saw in those 1943 and 2019 comparisons is that the river has been so constricted. So what we're allowing to do is expand and hopefully create even more uh, complex and diverse habitats uh, through here. So yeah, again, this is the, uh, the great work that uh, the subgroup did here. So this was done in February, 2020. And so we'll kind of be working through this mile long design kind of showing photos. And then here's the lower Howard Preserve. So what we're looking at here is the apex jam structure. This structure is pretty cool. It might not look like much now, but 
it took about six log, six trees to build this structure. And actually the trunks of those trees extend 50 to 60 feet out. And it was amazing. This tree was here. We had to remove it, build the log structure. We replanted it. And in the spring, it came back. So <laughs> that was really cool to see. And you could also see a lot of our willows that we planted came in. Uh, my dog, Gus, he's admiring it. He's looking at it with, with awe. So uh, really happy. And this is really going to go a long way with, with enhancing uh, habitat. Uh, another design component. So these white figures here, these are called boulder cluster formations. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more why they're important in the next project. But they do really create kind of more pocket water, which is diverse you know, throughout this kind of zone through here, instead of just lining the whole uh, channel with rock, which has historically be, been done, and I'll talk more about that, but it also ended up creating this nice large run right through here. And we did two of those, and purpose of these is to create these habitats, but also provide some grade control, right? We want to provide some flood mitigation with, within this reach, and there's a lot of techniques where you could have both, and this is one of them. So. We had one here and then we also had a cluster down here. And it's also great for dogs if you wanna take them down and swim in as, as Gus is showing. And then this is uh, the side channel, which is right here. So this is a 700 foot side channel. Um, this yellow right here is an old levee, which we were able to breach uh, in two locations. So. I talked about bankful flow. So this side channel was set at bankful flow. We determined that bankful flow in this reach of river is about 1400 CFS at the Haley gauge. Unfortunately, the river only got to 1000 CFS this year. So we didn't see water in here. We did see some groundwater subbing up right through this area. And I think it really helped with uh, these willows that we planted uh, in here. And then we breached the levee in two spots. So the levee's right here. We actually breached them just above where this photo is. Uh, we breached them in two spots and that's gonna allow for the floodplain to be activated behind there at about a five to 10 year uh, flood event. So even higher than bank, bankful flow. And it was amazing. We, uh, we put some of these logs, embedded some of these logs in the bank with the idea that over time, some scouring will occur, the river will be able to form the channel itself. Even some of these cottonwood logs leafed out this year, which was, which was awesome. I mean, those, you give water to these things, they'll grow. So that was really cool to see. Um, our next project is our Sun Peak Preserve project. So, so kind of look where, the look where this project is located is about two miles north of the city of Ketchum. Um, this is the Human Meadows Pond. And this reach of river has seen severe impacts um, from historic actions. And this is really has, has led to channelization, um, incision, uh, down cutting, where we talked about with those tributaries, and we'll talk a little bit more, and a lot of bank hardening within this reach. Those failed rock drop structures. So back in the 90s, Idaho Department of Transportation uh, installed these rock drop structures uh, all along the Bigwood River. And there, the idea of these structures was to provide grade control, to slow the river down, so not to uh, decrease erosion. That was done in the 90s. They were never maintained, and most of them have since failed, and they're actually causing more problems. And I'll talk more about that. But then uh, the Human Meadows Pond itself, uh, this was built as a sediment trap and it's doing a great job of doing that uh, to the point where it's really causing problems in this reach of river. So some photos of the, uh, of the project site. So this is a photo of that uh, riprap that I showed before. Uh, but here is, that, is looking at the Sage Road Bridge, looking upstream. And you could see this, this bank is not really riprap, but probably most likely due to the constriction of the bridge, it, this, this section has been altered and kind of like what we've talked about before, when you alter a river to a point where it can't expand to the floodplain, it starts to down cut and dig down deeper and deeper and deeper. And the usual way down cut in or incision works, it actually works its way upstream from the point of where it started. So you can kind of see it 
you know, the bank's really high here, kind of slopes down. There's a side channel that comes in here. And then up here, it's looking pretty, you know, it looks like it's functioning pretty well, but there is a possibility that this down cutting can start moving up as well. And then here's some photos of one of those rock drop structures. So there's three of these structures within this project area and all of them have since failed. And what rock drop structures did, they took large rocks similar to what we did uh, building the boulder cluster formations. And, and it's funny, usually these structures, they're built with basalt. So that's another thing. If you're walking on a river and you see basalt, that's not natural, like right? someone put that there. So just kind of an eye opener. But anyway, uh, they, they would line the, pretty much the entire channel with these rocks and build it up to the point, you know, the idea was to slow the river down. But what happens when you put an artificial rise in the river, sediment piles up behind it to the point that the bottom of the river raises with it. And then what happens then is that the river becomes laterally unstable and wants to go around that uh, artificial rise. And that's what we've seen here. There's been a lot of erosion on this bank. You could see some up in here and also down in this lower stretch as well. So part of our project, we're gonna replace these rock drop structures with those boulder cluster formations that I talked about with the uh, Bellevue project. And then another issue with this reach is the Humel's Pond itself. So you could see that the main deposition zone is right around in this area. And if you've ever been out there, this area is just flat. And this section of the river is pretty high gradient. And what, what we're seeing, especially during larger floods, is that enough sediment is gonna be deposited here to the point where it's gonna block off this channel. For decades, there's always been a split flow channel through here. And once that gets really blocked off, and we're already seeing it being blocked off, uh, this photo was taken last fall, 2020. Um, all, that, all that water is gonna get pushed into this east channel. And then we're gonna see more down cutting, uh, more erosion, the Wood River Trails just right through here. And this, unfortunately, when, uh, if you look to the photo on the right, you have all this deposited bed load and sediment, it more it acts like a, a disturbance and noxious weeds are great at pioneering disturbed areas. And we're already seeing this happen with mullein and some of these are intermixed is actually knackweed. So this is gonna really, this area, if we don't do this project is gonna turn into a noxious weed pit. And it really just decreases uh, you know, habitat for, for wildlife. So, Here's kind of a before and after of what we're trying to do. So with this project, you know, again, you, you think about the greatest extent possible, right? You know, we can't, oh, we can't remove the highway and the Wood River Trail. We have to have some protections for the fire station. And we also are cognizant of the Human Meadows Pond has become a cherished amenity for many of us in the Wood River Valley. So we also wanna protect that as well. So how, how can you get both? So what we're proposing is that we'll be able to expand the floodplain width um, up above and below Sage Road. We're gonna be having uh, many uh, large woody debris structures on both banks. Because most of these, this channel through here is in size. It's not really providing much for habitat. And we're gonna use all that sediment that is deposited here and use that to block off the pond and excavate this part that has been severely deposited with sediment to the point where it's blocking flows off. So we can maintain that split channel flow. And it's really gonna go a long way with um, enhancing fish habitat in this reach. So now we're gonna talk about floodplain enhancement with beaver dam analogs. In the last few years, this has been a really popular method with enhancing tributaries, um, uh, especially around here and other parts of the state and Utah as well. And so in response to the Sharp Fire, which we're looking at here, uh, the land trust working with a huge list of partners, which I'll show, late, uh, I'll show later, We've been able to enhance about 10 miles of tributaries of the Littlewood River. So just over the hill, 
this is the Littlewood River down here, and here are the upper tributaries that feed uh, the Littlewood. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these projects. But before I do, so this was post sharp fire, uh, I believe in the fall. And you could see the fire raged through here. And this is, uh, I believe it's Upper Baw Creek. And you could see here, I mean, just resilient, did not, had no effect from the fire. And it's because, you know, there's active beaver act, uh, activity through this reach. You could see that the creek is not in size as we see in some uh, smaller tributaries where beavers have been removed. And I mean, this is what we wanna see, floodplain width to floodplain width, full connection. And it just really goes to show that doing these types of projects and these kind of maybe more prone to fire uh, areas really provides resiliency uh, for wildlife. And so this was amazing to see. Um, and you know, this wasn't work that we did. This is just uh, a natural system, of how it's supposed to function. Okay, okay. all right, froze up there a little bit. So there's kind of two kind of common structures. You got beaver dam analogs, and then you got pole assisted log structures. So a beaver dam analog is pictured here on your left. And what these um, BDAs are supposed to do is it's supposed to mimic beaver activity. So these are built um, to span the entire channel. And then they're packed with mud and leaves and, and anything you could find that's around you. And the purpose is to mimic beaver activity to the point of holding back water. And the idea is that you build, you build this up and then high flows come next year and you want sediment to kind of fill this all in. You come back the next year, you build it up even higher, and then you could start connecting into the floodplain. And another reason why these projects are, are really popular, it, they're really um, low cost compared to some other projects. Uh, they're low cost, kind of lower design fees. They're heavy on labor, but when you have a big partner partnership and collaborative and get, you know, these are projects that volunteers can do, anyone can do this. Um, it, it, you get a lot of people out there and you can do some great work pretty quick. The uh, pole assisted log structure. So here the purpose is not to hold back water, but actually to mimic more river function. Um, and they're usually built with larger wood. You can see here this kind of smaller wood where you do pound some post in to kind of keep it all together. Here you use larger wood. And it's supposed to kind of mimic how a creek or a river would function. And it, it's kind of sometimes counterintuitive to some other uh, projects that people have done, but like for this one, I think some people call this kind of like a bank buster. So we're trying to push flows into this bank and we want this sediment to get eroded and into the creek. So these structures on the left can capture that sediment and hopefully we could build back up um, in, into the floodplain. So pretty, pretty neat stuff that's going on. And, and I do have to say our, um, this is, being run by our lands program director, Carrie Ork. She's done a great job. Um, she's done, you know, the 10 miles of work on the Littlewood, but we've also done work on Rock Creek and Fish Creek as well. So it's really been coming out nicely. And so, yeah, again, we can't do any of this work without great partnerships and collaboration. Um, here's a long list of uh, partners that have been involved with the Shark Fire Restoration. Some of them just involved with uh, funding Park, some of them involved with actually helping to build. And then, you know, we couldn't do any of this work without landowner participation. So we really appreciate the landowners letting us get out there and do these uh, great projects. And kind of go over the benefits of these uh, BDA projects. You know, we're, we're raising up the creek, so we're raising up the water water table to the surface. And by doing that, you increase water quantity. We're getting floodplain connectivity, which is enhances riparian plants and forage for wildlife, and especially for sage grouse. You know, I think 
lot of these projects, people are thinking like, oh, you're building these for beavers so they can eventually come back in, but they actually have a great benefit for sage grouse. They, um, you know, that mesic uh, habitat, which is pretty much like the transition zone from the creek to the sagebrush step, is really important that that habitat's functioning properly. So it has the right forbs and grasses for juvenile sage grouse and it really helps them with their survival. And as we showed in the first photo in this section, uh, these types of projects build resiliencies towards wildfire. And then of course, we can't forget about the fish. It really uh, helps with, with fish habitat as well. So. And so we kind of talked about projects, floodplain connectivity. Um, so I talked about this earlier. Now we're talking about tributary connectivity. Uh, again, this is Sun Valley Lake Dam. This is a very early going on with this project. We've had conversations with Sun Valley Company, trying to figure out a way we can have some kind of fish passage that you know we want to be respectful to them that doesn't hurt their operations or the structural integrity of the dam, but allows fish and really up during uh, the rainbow trout migration. So I showed this photo before. If we could have fish passage above this, we could have close to 20 miles of habitat for spawning fish. So again, we're trying to mimic our fishery uh, like it used to be and doing this project would really add to that. And it's kind of like a bathtub, you know, in a bathtub or in an aquarium, you're only gonna be able to have so many fish, but if you make that aquarium bigger, you're gonna have more big fish. And that's what we're trying to do to connect fish to these awesome uh, beaver dam and spring fed ponds in the upper part. But it's early going and we're, we're still kind of working on that. Ryan, do you have some ideas of how you might um, get fish around that dam? Um, yeah, does it, so, it looks insurmountable without, you know, uh, major structural change. So what kind of things are you, are you folks thinking about at this point, knowing that it takes lots of partners and conversation and time? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. So the, the wood part of this structure, so it's a timber truss dam, uh, was built in the 30s. And in the 30s, it had fish passage built into it. And so this is looking straight at the dam from Dollar Road. And uh, the old fish passage went to the right. So it went mm. this way. And then in the 1960s, Dollar Road was built. and for some reason that, that fish ladder got filled in. And it's funny, if you look through the historical stocking records in, with IDFG, that's when they started stocking the upper sections of Trail Creek, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right around when Dollar Road was built. In the 90s or sometime in the 90s, they had to build this spillway to allow uh, really to protect the wooden part of the dam. There was some, um, kind of violation with excavating sediment that got into the big wood. So DEQ got involved and they, they uh, worked with Sun Valley Company to reestablish that fish ladder, the same one that was built, uh, or at least in the same location that was built in the thirties. But after a couple of years of operations that failed as well. And I think what it was is that the entrance to the top of the lake was too high and that fish can only get there when the lake was full and mm -hmm. it didn't really allow for, for fish passage. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're looking at these projects and it's kind of funny, I, ever since I started, I get a new project. I'm like, ah, oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> Slam dunk. <laughs> Things always come up and it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of cool because the progression of these projects and what the final project or the final results are. Uh, you know, it's pretty cool to see the evolution of a, of a project. So we're still kind of ongoing, but I think one of the, what, what we're going to look at is try to get fish passage at this, this spillway here. I think it will provide the best opportunity. It won't uh, interfere with the structural integrity of the timber truss of the wood part of the dam. Um, and again, close to a conceptual design, kind of see what that looks like. Mm. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. So our final project, and now this is looking at 
reversing those bad pra practices of riprap. So this is a Colorado Gulch uh, on our Colorado Gulch Preserve. It's just south of Haley, a uh, little ways. And so here's an aerial imagery of 2015. So the Colorado Gulch Road came down, ran along the river a little bit, and then it came down through here. 20, the 2017 flood, so this is an aerial imagery of 19, but in 2017, the river took enough bank out. It, it's kind of a subtle difference if you look at both of them, but it, it moved enough where pretty much took out this whole section road right here. And then of course, um, if you live down in Haley, you're aware that it also inter interfered um, or compromised the dam to the point where the county removed it. So, so we've been working with the county since then, since 2018 to, instead of, you know, continuing this bad practice of bringing in fill uh, to raise the road, bring in riprap to protect the road, which has been going on for decades, right? The county has been fighting the river at this location. Let's do more of a kind of holistic approach where we're still gonna be able to have access for the community, but we'll do it in kind of a less heavy handed way. <clears throat> so we've been working with the county. We're gonna to plan to have two pedestrian bridges. There's an old historic side channel right here. And you can see it kind of flows down um, and um, have a small pedestrian bridge there and then have a wider spanning pedestrian bridge uh, at the same location of where the, the old road bridge was. So having this wider span will allow more flood flow waters to go under it and won't structurally compromise it. But another reason why that dam or dam, that road was uh, compromised is that it's a lot of fill and riprap was put here. So it pushed a lot of that flow towards the dam. And what we're proposing is to remove that, increase floodplain connectivity. Um, you know, we're gonna remove a total of 1100 cubic yards of artificial fill, uh, mostly associated with the road that used to go through there. Here's a photo of riprap. This was placed in 07 in response to the 2006 flood. We're gonna rip out that uh, riprap, which is about 300 cubic yards. We're gonna put in several large woody debris log jam structures that, again, we're now we're kind of reversing, trying to gain on that 40% riprap and have those higher densities of fish within this area. And then we're also gonna reconnect, right behind here is where that side channel starts. And it's about 1300 feet, um, which is gonna provide a great opportunity for spawning. It's gonna provide refuge for fish during um, uh, those high muddy flows. And we're still gonna be able to do all this, but still provide access for the community to Colorado Gulch. So that was my last project. Um, I, like, <clears throat> I like ending with this photo because I think when people come up here, they walk along the river or people, you know, even me, when I walk along the big way, I think it's beautiful, I think it's great. But really digging down deeper and looking at all the historic bad practices that have happened, what our fishery used to be, there's a lot of things we can do to really reverse those bad practices and really enhance fish and wildlife uh, habitat. So if we have time, take some questions. Well, thanks, Ryan. Um, we do have time and Great. we can just uh, maybe make small talk for a minute or so while people type questions in. Um, do you have any suggestions if a person lives on the river? What's one of the things a, a homeowner can do or can think about to, um, to be progressive in this way? I think doing projects like this instead of riprap um, really go a long way, especially if you could add some woody debris. And actually that woody debris, let me uh, find that one diagram. <clears throat> That way to be debris actually deflects flows away from your banks. So it actually helps protect it as well. It also provides habitat. And then allowing the river to expand to the greatest extent possible is also 
uh, great. I think some people, they want to build levees. You know, we always suggest, well, if you're going to build a levee, make it as close to your structure as possible to allow some of those expansion of flood flows. And really you could, you know, these levees, you kind of see it all over Haley and other places, you know, you could build them to look like a, like a berm and vegetate them with trees and you wouldn't really know it's acting as a levee. Um, so there's just those two things I think are the two biggest things that a homeowner can do uh, living along the river. Uh, you know, with the idea, we understand like people need to protect their property. And, uh, but there's ways you could do it where you're not really impacting uh, habitat, especially habitat for fish as, as much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a multi-part question from James. Uh, he asks, is there any habitat restoration work focused on the Wood River Sculpin? Pretty cool to have a fish species living in the watershed that is found nowhere else. I know. James, it's a great question. Uh, I wish they were listed. Um, if we had, if they were listed on the e Endangered Species Act, we can maybe get more funding. Uh, but Fish and, Day Fish and Game has done some studies. So Sculpin, they like kind of those clean kind of gravel uh, reaches of the river. I think when you have a constricted river like we do now, those gravels are constantly getting washed out at those large flows, which probably has an impact of sculpin. Um, one of the studies that Fish and Game did, they kind of did like um, kind of a broad population estimate. I, I think they're doing pretty well, but I think the projects that, um, that we've showcased tonight will go a long way with you know, helping those fish. And, and I agree, I mean, in the big wood and little wood, you, you can't find Wood River scoping anywhere else on Earth. So it's pretty cool to have, and they're pretty neat fish. So maybe you could describe them a little bit, because um, they, they're a fish, but they kind of sort of don't really—they look like a very odd fish. Yeah, you know, they're a they're a bottom dweller. Uh, they like to live in between the interstitial uh, spots among rocks. They're actually kind of a voracious predator. Um, of insects and also they'll, they'll eat small fish as well. Um, they get to a, maybe a total, the largest I've seen in my snorkel survey days were about four to five inches. They don't really get much bigger than that. Most of them are around that three to four. Um, they're kind of a mottled brown looking. They have a really broad head and their, um, their pectoral fins are kind of located more on the bottom to kind of anchor them into the gravel. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're kind of a unique fish. Yeah. And then the, the continuation of that question. Um, also, what is known about mountain whitefish in the big wood? Um, this individual comments, I've seen some monster whitefish. Yeah, whitey. So I, I love whitefish. I, I think they're the king of fish, to be honest. Um, <laughs> If you're out steelheading, you're freezing your feet, you're freezing your, your fingers, you're not catching any steelhead. And then all of a sudden you see your line just twitching throughout this long run. And those are whitefish kind of nipping. And what I usually do is I switch my rig and, and then you catch whitefish and you kind of get rejuvenated, get refocused. <laughs> um, but I will say with whitefish, you know, they, they have high fecundity. So fecundity is a fancy way, uh, high eggs, a lot of eggs. Uh, a lot of productivity. Um, and then they actually provide a, a really great food base for salmonids in the state of Idaho. Um, you know, compared to the upper salmon, where there's a lot of whitefish, we don't have as many here um, in the big wood, uh, just as far as like numbers, but they are in here. Um, there are some big ones. Um, and I think they're really, great fish and they provide really uh, a unique niche. Um, they're fall spawners. So uh, they spawn in October, November, and then their fry come out kind of at the end of winter. And really uh, the winter time period for salmon is the most critical. Uh, that's when you see most uh, natural mortality. So having those fry in the system kind of at the end of winter or early spring really provides a food source for those fish to make it 
into the summer season. Hmm. And the mountain whitefish is a native species? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Well, so far, that is our last question. I'll pause just a moment here to see if anyone, oops, here we go. Uh, John Wright is asking, you're speaking about the improvements to habitat when replacing riprap sections. Please also speak about how riprap leads to faster current, detrimental to all adjacent reaches, reaches, and actually more risk for river properties. Thank you, John. Yeah, and John, you're, you're exactly right. Um, and actually, you know, in that Thoreau paper, he does talk about, and there's actually many other papers if you just kind of Google effects of, of riprap. Um, you know, when a section of river is riprap, it's kind of funny, it's, it's a hard way to think about it, uh, to think about it, but actually riprap attracts water. And if you think about it, water goes to the least resistance. So you have this vertical wall of rock, where on the other side, um, like that one photo, where was that? This photo here on the left, here you have nothing really stopping the flow. Granted, you might have a couple of rocks, but here you have more uh, kind of roughness. Mm. You know, the, the, the river is kind of getting slowed down, resistance. So actually riprap attracts water. It's something kind of counterintuitive, but it does. Mm -hmm. And John's exactly right. You know, you're restricting the river. You're causing huge, you're trying to protect yourself from flooding you're actually causing more impacts, especially immediately downstream to your neighbors. Um, that's why the land trust, we closely monitor these stream alteration permits throughout the valley and try to make comments to avoid people um, to continuing to riprap our river. You know, the, the row study clearly shows it decreases fish densities, but you know, after 2017, flooding was on the minds of everyone and to be honest, um, everyone re rip wrapped, rip wrapped their property again, even though they got flooded, it didn't work. So, you know, it's something that the land trust has been talking about. I think coming out soon, you're going to see more robust educational programs focusing uh, to folks who live on the river and try to reverse this bad practice that's been going on for decades. People still get flooded, and it's just really. Uh, unfortunate for the river and for people who live immediately downstream. I mentioned to you when we were doing our dry run that I lived on the river in 83. Right. And um, that was the biggest flood before 19 or 2017. Um, but somebody, the river was ripping and somebody rip wrapped above me and it forced the water to hit that riprap. It ricocheted against a rock cliff, and then it ricocheted back into some soft mm -hmm. farmland. And in one day, about, I'd say, a dozen huge cottonwoods, like the one that you see in that picture on the left, um, were just like pickup sticks all over. Um, I mean, it just, it just ripped them out. Um, so, right. and I think people tend to re react. It's like, oh my God, I need to protect my land. Um, and so they just react and put that riprap in without thinking about the consequence of what might be happening downstream. Right. And, you know, like I said before, people have the right to protect their property. But if you could do alternatives to riprap, it goes a long way. And just giving up a little bit, allow for those flood flows to expand just a little bit more, you know, helps with your neighbor's property, having a solid uh, riparian habitat with large woody debris in there protects your property as well. Um, I think people, they, they see riprap, they think it's a strong bank. They look at, you know, the bank on the right. I don't see that eroding or didn't erode anytime soon. Then, you know, this photo was taken last year. Um, I don't know if it had severe impacts. You know, you see some large trees, they didn't get washed away. Uh, from the 2017 flood. So um, having a more natural land uh, kind of bank does protect your property, so. And then John uh, adds a comment to his question. He says, it leads to damage upstream also because faster current 
leads to more erosion, which works its way upstream, which you touched on earlier in your presentation as well. Yeah, you know, since riprap does attract water, and then that's when you start having that down cut in and it starts working its way upstream. Um, and yeah, it's just really unfortunate. I think, you know, I think some folks, they just don't know uh, this is what they were told. And I think, you know, once we roll out our educational program, um, hopefully it'll change the minds of some folks and we could reduce the amount of uh, riprap on our river. And this, I didn't mention it in the beginning, but um, this talk will be uploaded to the Haley Public Library website and available 24 seven in just a couple of days. So um, it can be a good reference for anyone. And then Roger asks a question, is the fish ladder at Lane Ranch providing connectivity to Upper Elkhorn Creek? If so, would that work at Trail Creek Pond? Um, so yeah, we're actually looking at a project up above the fish ladder, uh, which would reduce flooding impacts to Elkhorn Creek uh, neighborhood, but also enhance habitat uh, quite a bit. So that connection, that, that fish ladder, it's, it's on a very small scale of what we're looking at at Trail Creek, but we're looking at something very similar. It's just gonna be bigger, um, much longer. Uh, let me go to Trail Creek. So yeah, so this photo is taken from Dollar Road and below, right underneath Dollar Road is a large culvert. There's really not much room to work with. Um, so we're looking at a possibility of extending the fish ladder out this way, have a turn and pull and then bring it back. So it'll be much longer um, than that Elkhorn Creek ladder. And as far as fish making it up, they get stopped right at that twin was a Jupiter lane just above there that neighborhood um, there's several fish passage barriers which uh, my understanding is that the Elkhorn was it, I forget what it's called Elkhorn Association um, they're actually looking to there's a bunch of series of ponds they're actually looking to get rid of them because they cost too much to maintain so anytime you have this artificial um, kind of treatment to the river, maintenance becomes an issue. Um, and over the decades, they're starting to fill in the ponds and it costs too much to do it. So they're looking to get rid of them, which is a good thing, um, but have better kind of repairing habitat through there. I'm unsure if fish passage is gonna be part of that. I think having access to that uh, Twin Creek up there extends quite a bit would be, um, a great addition to the fish ladder that the TU Hemingway chapter did. So, you know, but really they get they get stopped, you know, shortly moving up up there. Okay. Well, um, Ryan, that looks like the last question uh, for tonight unless somebody slips one in lickety split. So uh, thank you so much for a, a fascinating look at what some of the problems are historical issues around um, habitat and, and um, fish um, movement uh, on our rivers and also the great work the Land Trust is doing with its partners to uh i mean some really creative work that you're doing the 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 beaver um uh little beaver barriers uh, were pretty slick um yeah. talking about raising up those incised creeks it was a pretty pretty neat uh, pretty neat idea so um, i thank you very very much for your presentation and i thank everyone a lot for joining us tonight like i said i'll do some light editing on this talk and it will be posted on the haley public library website within a couple of days so thank you again ryan yeah and I, i'd like to thank the haley public library um you know, the the diversity of, of talks you guys did this summer was awesome. Um, I hope you continue in doing it. it. It's great that it's, you know, it'd be better in person, but I think Zoom allows more people outside to um, attend. So, you know, when we get to that point, great to do these in person, but you guys are doing a great job. So appreciate it. Mm.
Thank you very much. And one of our uh, one of our attendees um, zoomed in from Pocatello, so that was uh, oh, that was pretty go. terrific. So yeah. um, again, thank you so very much, Ryan. Okay. Thanks, everyone.